Well, good evening and welcome. I think that this evening hopefully will be a good conversation, and that's one of the ways that I want us to look at it, because I know that many of you have um, uh, interests in terms of, of this topic as well. Uh, looking at the, the native peoples, the American Indians who were here prior to European arrival, um, we have to put things together from a, a variety of sources. Um, much of it traditional, much of it oral tradition. And um, there are some things, though, that turn out to be somewhat of a surprise because the rivers become uh, not only boundaries occasionally, but much more frequently for the, um, the original inhabitants of this region. They were, in fact, means of uh, transportation and of trade. Uh, that become very important. Uh, later on, and for us today, we tend to think of rivers most frequently as boundaries. Um, in the state of Missouri, the, the Big Muddy, or the Missouri River, is in fact the uh, boundary of numerous counties, uh, northern or southern boundary. And of course, in the northwest corner, just going right up from here where we are in Kansas City, it is also a state boundary. And then the eastern part of the state is entirely defined by the boundary of the Mississippi River. So Europeans were much more used to this idea of rivers as boundaries. Not so much with the, uh, with the native peoples, because for them, they were a means to get somewhere. They were a means of making connections uh, across and um, of getting things done, in some cases at least going downstream, a little more rapidly. Well... Let's, uh, I have some maps. One of the things that you have to understand about historians is that many of us are almost in love with maps. And I probably am uh, even more that way than most. But uh, this is a map that um, uh, was prepared for a book on the Osage. So it has certain sites on it that are particular um, uh, sites that the uh, Osage were um, uh, significant in. But one of the things that I really like about this particular drawing is that it indicates um, the points of rivers and the fact that you found um, uh, Indian sites located on the rivers. But more to the point, you find the rivers themselves ultimately being named for the Indian tribes. And, th and then, later, the uh, territories and ultimately states get named for the rivers in, uh, in this particular fashion. One of the things that we're going to understand as we go through the evening is that uh, there is a sort of hierarchy of influence among the various Indian tribes that uh, found their way into our part of North America. Um, there had been native peoples that had lived here um, well, from back to, uh, toward the uh, time of Christ, if you will, 2,000 and more years ago. And then more recently, uh, the Line Creek area, we have evidence of human habitation. But the, the uh, folks who were here at the time that Europeans made contact, initially in the uh, early 18th century or the 1700s, uh, were the Missouri, the Osage, and the Kansa. From everything we can understand, the Missouri, who were also, by the way, known as the Missouri, and by the way, you know we have a state question in Missouri. It's how do you pronounce the name of the state? Is it Missouri or Missouri? Well, my point is that uh, if you look at the Indian tribe, and especially the French approximation of it, you get the answer to the question. It's either one. It's the Missouri Indians, or they can be called the Missouri. So we can go either way with that. But uh, they came uh, into the area, as best we can understand, probably around 1400. Um, they had lived further to the east. Uh, some indications are that they may have been as far north as the Great Lakes region, uh, or they may have been somewhat further south. Um, the traditions indicate that uh, they were pushed to the west by the Iroquois, uh, who were a confederacy of tribes. Uh, that we usually associate primarily with upstate New York, um, but had extensions out in terms of influence. And the, um, the Iroquois were significant for one other thing, and that is that um, at a certain point in time, they actually uh, 
excluded one of the members of what was known as the Iroquois Confederacy by Europeans later, and that member group that they excluded were the Huron. But actually, that's not what that group of people call themselves. They call themselves the Wyandot. And so the Wyandots and the Hurons are actually the same group of people, and they had been pushed out, in this case, up into what is today Michigan and Canada around the Great Lake that is named for them, Lake Huron. Um, later, in the 19th century, of course, the Hurons, or Wyandots, are removed into Kansas um, and wind up being very close to um, uh, areas that the uh, Missouri had been uh, pushed into at a later point. The Missouri were a, uh, their language was a Sioux language, and indeed uh, all of the tribes that we are going to be looking at this evening were Sioux language speakers, uh, but the, the Missouri were Chaweri Sioux uh, in their language, uh, which is a dialect that is um, uh, related to, for example, the Lakota Sioux of uh, the tribe located much further upriver on the Missouri. Uh, but it's also a language dialect that is related to the Tegean Sioux that the Osage, the Kansa, and for that matter, the Omaha, the Ponca, and the Quapaw all spoke Tegean Sioux. Um, if you're wondering, okay, how, are, how do these different languages relate to each other? Possibly the simplest way to put it is that the Osage and the Kansa, their languages would be about as similar or different, depending on your perspective, as Spanish and French. In other words, they could probably understand each other, at least to a great extent. They had similar uh, vocabulary. Their sentence structure would, be, it would have been fairly similar uh, in, in that regard. But there would have been different sounds, different pronunciations, and in, over time, uh, somewhat different words for uh, things that they would have encountered. Um, uh, but it's a fairly, their languages were such that they could generally be, make themselves understood by each other. Now, the Missouri that the, the Osage and the Kansa encountered when they came a little bit later, probably somewhere in the late 1400s, arriving from um, uh, the Wabash River Valley in Indiana and adjacent areas, again, the, the evidence is that they got pushed to the, to the west uh, by another round of, of expansion on the part of the Iroquois um, at this point, because this is too early for any European um, impact to be felt. Uh, if we're talking the, uh, the 15th century, uh, Columbus is at the very end of that century, and of course European contact is confined to the Atlantic coast throughout the, uh, the next century uh, until we get to actual settlement. But the, the reality of the situation is that what happens with the coming of uh, the Osage and the Kansa, they speak in the same language family as the Missouri or Missouri, but their language is going to be enough different that it's rather more like the difference between French and German, which means there might be a word or two that would sound somewhat alike, but most of it is going to be very, very different. French and German are Indo-European languages like English and Dutch and uh, Romanian for that matter. But French and German are rather different. And as a result of that, the Osage and the Kansa did not necessarily view the um, Missouri as a... Um, uh, necessarily a compatible group of people. They did view each other, that is the Kansa and the Osage, viewed each other as being, um, you might say, close relatives. And indeed, probably when they moved out of the area to the east and came into this part of the country, they had in fact been very closely related. Religiously, their beliefs are quite similar and, and such. But then the Missouri have rather different uh, contrasting uh, beliefs from that standpoint. And the Osage, as it turns out, are the most numerous of all of these groups. You'll notice on this particular map uh, that they indicate that there's an area uh, in the, uh, along the Missouri River where you have the, the Little Osage, the Great Osage, 
And then uh, there is an Osage presence that's down into uh, what would today be Oklahoma and, and Arkansas uh, that uh, happens with this. Now, overall, the area or the range of the Osage, especially in the 18th century, the 1700s, so we're looking at the time that would include the American Revolution, uh, the French and Indian War, etc. Those are all taking place far to the east, but there are ripple effects that do come out this way. Certainly, the French traders by that time will have arrived and uh, uh, begun to make a difference. But the, uh, when the French do arrive in the early 1700s, where they encounter the Osage is what you see on um, inside this rather oddly shaped um, uh, oval. I'm using my imagination here um, that, that shows up um, in this. And it's interesting that they name the main river that they come across what is today Missouri on it, the, for the tribe that was uh, the older uh, or the oldest of these three groups. The, they had arrived first, the Missouri. Uh, but that's simply because the French encountered them um, further downstream. So they named the larger river after the Missouri, even though that's not the largest tribe. Then they, uh, when they come to the Osage River, uh, they follow it uh, upstream uh, from that area, and they encounter uh, the, uh, the Great Osage, which had their uh, main villages in the area uh, that would today be a, a little bit uh, southeast of uh, Nevada, Missouri, in, uh, but on the, the Osage River. So that river is named for that tribe. They, then as the French continued to the west, uh, they encountered along the Missouri River, but further up from the Missouri, they encountered the Kansa Indians. And um, so the name of the river uh, that, those, that that particular group is um, generally found in winds up being the, the, the Kansas River, uh, named after the Kansa tribe um, in, in that respect. Now, as I said, those names then, especially Missouri and Kansa, will wind up as um, territorial and state names at, uh, at a much later time. Now this particular drawing or map is intended to give you some indication. Uh, the, the last one uh, was looking at the range of the Osage. This one is looking at the range of the Kansa. Now, this comes out of a history of the Kansas Indians uh, written by uh, William Unruh, uh, now retired from Wichita State University. And he had a rather, I think, broad, inclusive idea about the, the range of the Kansa. Now, this is prior to uh, European uh, contact uh, in the early 1700s, but he um, extends the, their range uh, both further north, clear up into present-day Iowa, and then all out across uh, the Kansas Plains uh, along the uh, Smoky Hill and the, uh, 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 the Republican River in that area that uh, contribute then to the formation of the Kansas River uh, as that name is applied beginning at Junction City in, in Kansas and coming further east uh, at, at a later time the name is applied there. So, but they, the idea is that you've got the Kansa Indians ranging over a wide area and you had the Osage uh, ranging over a wide area. You can see that there are overlaps. Whereas there is not an overlap, which is very important in terms of Indians and trade, is that the Osage had control, as you can see from this map, uh, especially in the Ozark area. And the Ozarks were a much richer area for a variety of things. Uh, minerals that could be used in a variety of ways for trade goods or decoration, uh, for animals, for uh, pelts and furs uh, that could be used for uh, clothing, for um, um, decorative um, purposes as well, and of course uh, for meat purposes uh, as well. Now, all of these tribes, the Missouri, the Kansa, and the Osage, uh, also then engaged in buffalo hunts. And that would be uh, the major summer activity, would be to range out into the western area. And so we see that both reflected here in terms of uh, the Osage uh, working out into central to western Kansas by today's boundaries, and then the Kansa 
uh, slightly further north, doing roughly the same kind of thing. Uh, the Missouri, uh, by the time that the Osage and Kansa are really fully developed into the 18th century, and they're in full contact with the, uh, the French, uh, the Missouri by that time essentially lost out. Uh, and they are moving to the northwest where they unite with their very close language um, uh, relatives, if you will, the Oto. And that occurs up in uh, what is, uh, turns out today to be Nebraska. It's significant that early in the 19th century when Lewis and Clark are making their way up the Missouri River and uh, on their exploration to the headwaters of, of the Missouri, that the first Indians that they actually encounter outside of um, uh, a few folks in the immediate St. Louis area, but the first that they encounter who are actually uh, living and, and sustaining themselves uh, along the Missouri River turn out to be Missouri Indians, but they encounter them in what is today Nebraska. Uh, and that's because the Missouri and the Oto had essentially combined uh, forces, if you will, at that point for survival purposes and um, had, had continued on in that way. Let's uh, stay with uh, this particular map here for the moment. Now, the kind of trade that the, the various tribes engaged in is not the kind of trade that we'll see when the Europeans, especially the French, begin to come in in the 18th century. Because prior to the Europeans, basically the Indian tribes lived in pretty self-sufficient manner wherever they were, and regardless of, of which tribe we're talking about. The items that would have been, been actually traded uh, from one to another were really of two kinds, one of which was um, what we might call in modern day language luxury items, uh, items that um, would be used for, for decoration or to mark um, uh, individuals or that might be of ceremonial use. Uh, one of the, uh, the best known uh, trade items throughout North America uh, was uh, what was, it came to be known as pipestone. And pipestone was a particular kind of rock that was found uh, primarily in southern Minnesota, or what is today southern Minnesota. And uh, it was called pipestone because it usually would have a hollowed out um, area and it could, be, in fact, then be cut into lengths and literally used uh, as, uh, as a pipe uh, for ceremonial purposes. This made it very, um, uh, you know, a great deal of interest as far as the tribes were concerned. And as a result of that, it got traded all over the North American continent uh, from one, one tribe to another and uh, utilized in much that, uh, that fashion. Um, decorative materials of one sort or another. One of the things that you're probably familiar with is the, um, the great deal of time and ink that gets spilt in American history talking about how the, uh, when the Europeans come, uh, they trade with the Indians for glass beads or baubles or something of this sort. Well, the reality is that the reason that that was of interest to the Indians is because those could be used for decorative purposes to uh, distinguish one individual from another, and they were supplies that they didn't, in fact, have themselves. They didn't need food. They didn't need clothing. They didn't need building supplies because they, had, that, they supplied themselves. They, it was these other things that were not always available in their immediate environment uh, that were going to be useful uh, as, as far as they were concerned. Uh, from a European standpoint, these seemed like uh, terribly inexpensive and trifling things. From the Indian standpoint, they were useful simply because they were something they didn't have. Um, and uh, they had a lot of land. They didn't necessarily have a lot of, uh, uh, of these possessions, these, these kinds of things that might be used in that fashion. Now there's another kind of trade that goes on, and this has to be said, and that is a slave trade. Slave trade existed among North American Indians prior to European contact, um, and it was something that um, was a uh, you know, fairly regular kind of occurrence. Uh, slaves were normally acquired through um, the uh, uh, 
through uh, battles, uh, through uh, you know, limited warfare. One thing about Indian warfare compared to European warfare, Indian warfare was never to completely wipe out um, another group. You wanted to limit their territorial uh, uh, impact on you, and if you could capture a few um, uh, folks, then you would either incorporate them into your group through adoption, or you would enslave them. And uh, this kind of activity was a fairly, uh, you know, happened with, with some frequency. Um, it's a kind of activity that then translates at a later time after contact with Europeans who bring animals like the horse that are very useful in, in other ways as far as the Indians are concerned. Uh, and so warfare will be extended uh, at that point uh, to acquire uh, horses in part for trade. So all of these things are, are a part of what goes on. The slave trade was not the dominant trade, but it was a significant trade that occurred prior to European contact as well as after European contact um, uh, in this. And then other things such as, as the horse trade, uh, which could include uh, the, you know, the capturing of horses uh, from a European standpoint, the stealing of horses. Um, but from an Indian standpoint, it's essentially the same thing as, as acquiring uh, captives in battle and acquiring captive horses in, in battle, or uh, so, however else might work out in that fashion. So there are a variety of kinds of trade that go on with this. Again, the rivers provide a means of, of transit and um, connection as far as uh, pulling that about. Now, with the coming of the Europeans, and especially then when we get into the 19th century, the uh, establishment of um, uh, the United States as the sort of representative European presence in government in um, uh, this part of North America, uh, we begin to see other lines being drawn. This is a line, or this is a map of um, Missouri in the territorial period which would be from roughly 1812, uh, because before that time, Missouri was a part of Louisiana territory. But in 1812, Louisiana is created as a state, and so we become upper Louisiana territory, and very soon after, Missouri territory, uh, by the end of the War of 1812. And we have a territorial legislature, which is in the, you know, and, and they establish counties. But what this particular map, uh, I, I want to, uh, show you especially, notice that on the left-hand side, beginning with Jackson County, which I think you can make out, uh, it has its border over the Missouri River at the north, and then working all the way down what we might call the western tier of counties uh, from the Missouri River south into Arkansas, notice that there is that uh, there's a very heavy line that is drawn at what would be the eastern, almost the eastern edge of today's Jackson County. It's actually just a, a, a few miles in from uh, today's eastern boundary of the county. It is a line that's literally drawn from what was originally established in 1808 as Fort Clark, but became known as Fort Osage um, after that time. And that line is a surveyor's line that is directly north and south, and it extends from Fort Osage on the Missouri River in the north to Frog Bayou on the Arkansas River in the south. Uh, and so it puts it all the way down to, and Frog Bayou is actually enters the Arkansas River, and that's the point that they're, um, they're drawing to. The, the surveyor's line is from Fort Osage straight south, and it intersects the Arkansas River where uh, Frog Bayou uh, enters the river at that point. This is slightly east of Fort Smith, Arkansas, on the Arkansas River. Um, the area that is west of that was, uh, to what is today the line between Missouri and Kansas during the Missouri Territorial Period is considered to be a part of Missouri, but it is a part of Missouri that is closed to uh, non-Indian settlement because according to the treaty that was signed by William Clark on behalf of the United States government with the leaders of the Osage tribe uh, in 1808, um, everything west of Fort Osage was Osage territory, Indian territory. 
And part of the reason for that line is, is the presence of Fort Osage itself. But if you go, as you go south, and you, especially when you get down into um, uh, the, the counties to the south, the villages of the, of the great Osage band of the overall Osage tribe were located on the Osage River just to the west of that line. So that is the, really the key area that's being protected by this Osage line. What's even more interesting is that the Osage line was in existence at the time of Missouri statehood in 1821. And as a result of that, by 1820, um, uh, 1825, um, it, at that point, the um, uh, folks in Jefferson City, which had been declared to be the, the new uh, state capital of Missouri, wanted the state to fill out its borders, meaning all the way to the boundary that had been established that ran through where the Kansas River emptied into the Missouri River. That's the reason why this, the Missouri-Kansas line is where it is. Uh, it was drawn through that point. Now, in 1826, uh, that line will, um, uh, the, the actual mouth of the Kansas River will shift because of a flood, uh, but they maintain the actual boundary where it was surveyed uh, prior to the flood of 1826. And so it actually, uh, today's Kansas River empties into the Missouri River inside the state of Kansas, and the actual state line is literally a few hundred yards to the east of that. Um, but that's where the old entrance to the, uh, of the Kansas River and the Missouri was located at the time uh, that it was surveyed around statehood. Well, with the opening then of the rest, uh, you know, the, uh, from um, Jackson County in the north to uh, McDonald County at the very southern tip here, uh, what that meant was that's no longer going to be Osage territory. And so in 1825, in order to accomplish that and to allow for the organization of Jackson County at that time, what you have is William Clark returning to western Missouri and negotiating with the, with the Osage at the site of Fort Osage a second treaty, which then creates an Osage um, reservation that will run across the southern um, tier of Kansas uh, to the further to the west, and that will last until after the Civil War uh, in that particular location. I'll show you that on a map here in just a minute. But the Osage line, as it is shown here, is, is very interesting because at the time of Missouri statehood, it was illegal for non-Indians to be living in most of what is today Jackson County. That changed in 1825 uh, with the new treaty. Now, this particular map uh, shows you states and territories lined up on the west, but you'll notice that to the east, if you can read it, it says unorganized territory. And that, if you run across that in old maps, uh, you may have wondered what that means. Anybody have an idea? What did unorganized territory mean? At one level, it's kind of obvious. No government. No government. Uh, at least no government that the United States recognized as uh, a, a territorial government. Uh, but it also means that it hasn't been surveyed. It hasn't been prepared for sale. And then the third meaning is Indian territory. If it's unorganized territory, then it is left to the Indians. Um, uh, in here. Now, what uh, you may not be able to see are the dates that are indicated uh, with regard to the states, but we have uh, Arkansas on the bottom. Uh, it's actually a later state organized as a state in 1836. Um, Missouri organized, of course, in 1821, admitted to the Union at that time. And then you have uh, Iowa uh, admitted in 1846. You'll notice, however, that there is a different color for Northwest Missouri. And that particular area says 1837. Uh, what is this different colored area that's now the Northwest corner of Missouri? We have a particular name that we usually apply to that area. The Platte Purchase. And it's named that because the Platte River, um, sometimes mistakenly called the Little Platte, 
uh, flows through it. And of course, our Platte County is where the Platte River flows into the Missouri River. Um, by the way, Platte is, is a term that's used a lot. What does that mean? Have you ever run across the meaning of the term Platte? In French, it comes out something like braided river, and it means it's a flat, shallow river, but it flows as the Missouri does in uh, many cases, but especially the, the Platte River will flow in streams that, that are then separated by islands, so you get these, you know, sandbars really, not islands, but sandbars, so you get this kind of braided effect in the, in the floodplain of the river valley. Uh, the Missouri does this to some degree, the, the Platte does it a lot. And um, so the French name is basically a shallow braided river. Um, and the term Nebraska was actually a Pawnee term for the same river. So Nebraska is an Indian name for the river, Platte is a French name uh, for that particular river. But the Platte Purchase is not for the Platte River in Nebraska at all. It's the Platte River, of course, here in Missouri. And the, uh, the Platte Purchase was Indian land that had been, at the time of Missouri statehood, left to uh, especially the Iowa and Sac and Fox tribes that had moved down from what is today Iowa and essentially pushed the uh, re remnants of the Missouri upstream uh, to join with the Oto. This is all occurring in the first and second decades of the 19th century. At the same time, they pushed the Osage south of the um, uh, Missouri River uh, and basically consolidating their, themselves back down to the, the great Osage villages um, uh, down in uh, near Nevada in that particular section. So the, uh, the addition to the state of Missouri, and this is one of the few times in American history where a state actually gets additional land after it becomes a state. Uh, but the Platte Purchase was not a, an original part of the state of Missouri, whereas Jackson County down to McDonald County, even though it was not open to white settlement at statehood, was officially a part of the state of Missouri. Uh, so you had two different Indian territory uh, arrangements, if you will, that take place with that. Now then, this is another view of Indian territory. And this is a reflection of somewhat later maps. You see we still have an area as unorganized territory, which is mostly uh, what we would consider to be part of the Louisiana Purchase, um, outside of what is today Oklahoma, Kansas, uh, and Nebraska. Uh, but not entirely all of those uh, latter states um, in that. Now you'll notice on this particular map that there's a, sort of a greater Texas in, indicated here in the crosshatched area. Um, the Texans had delusions of grandeur. I, I do have to give a little truth in advertising here. I grew up in the state of New Mexico. I do not accept Texas and you know interpretation of history. Uh, Texas interpretation of, of American history is um, interesting and varied. Uh, but their view is that they control land all the way up into Wyoming, which, of course, they never controlled, uh, never occupied, uh, under, you know, but they claimed it. And when the United States ex uh, uh, annexed Texas in 1845, uh, the United States wanted to claim all of that. And that's what, in fact, then occasioned the war with Mexico in 1846, because Mexico, while willing to accept the smaller area of Texas that's shown in purple, they did not accept the boundary of the Rio Grande, uh, because in the valley of the Rio Grande, on both sides of the river, was significant uh, Mexican population, then as now. And uh, as a result of that, uh, you had a conflict over what the boundaries were. The United States said it was the Rio Grande. The um, uh, Mexico said, well, if we're going to agree on anything, it has, it's got to be the Nueces River, uh, which is what this other little boundary here is. See, I do have a pointer. This is the Nueces uh, River right here. But um, uh, the, the idea that uh, Texas uh, controlled uh, up through to the headwaters of the Rio Grande, which is back west of Pueblo, Colorado, and then from there straight on up into about Cheyenne, Wyoming, is um, delusion of grandeur. Uh, 
But again, you have to understand this is coming from a New Mexico boy, not a Texas boy. Okay. Now, to, to uh, show us uh, how then uh, this Indian territory that we saw in a, a, you know, in a larger context here, this is now divided up among a number of tribes, some of which were already here. The Osage, uh, the Kansa, the Missouri, all appear on this particular map. I'm going to go one further and show you, uh, hopefully maybe you can see this a little bit better, because um, I'm blowing up the, uh, the area that is directly west of us, uh, down to about northern Oklahoma. Uh, I mentioned that in 1825, the Osage Reservation is closed off in western Missouri, and we have this new 50-mile-wide uh, strip uh, that starts um, uh, about what would today be one tier of counties in from uh, Missouri and continued essentially across western Kansas. That was the new Osage res uh, Reservation uh, beginning in 1825. That lasts until the 1870s uh, when uh, the Osage will then be moved into what is today Osage County, Oklahoma, um, on land that had been taken from the Cherokee uh, Nation after the Civil War because a portion of the Cherokee Nation had fought with the Confederacy. Uh, so the federal government uh, takes um, the Cherokee Strip, uh, essentially, and they start to reallocate that. They put the Osage in here. They put the Kansa uh, Indians uh, in uh, this location, today's K County, Oklahoma, and, and so forth uh, with this. But you'll notice that we have a number of other uh, tribes indicated in various locations in what is today, um, especially uh, this would be uh, today's Oklahoma, this would be Kansas up to approximately this point here where it says Iowa and Sock and Fox. Uh, that's about the Nebraska state line. So the Oto and Missouri reservation there would be right on the state line. Um, as, as a result of that. And these tribes, from the Shawnee to the Delaware, um, uh, are moved in at a later time, from the 1820s through the 1840s. The last of the tribes to be brought in are, in fact, the Wyandots, and they are moved into what is today Wyandot County, Kansas, um, which was at that time a part of the Delaware Reservation. The Wyandots actually purchased um, the, uh, it's goes, the Wyandotte Reservation went about as far west as uh, 78th Street in today's uh, Kansas City, Kansas, Wyandotte County, uh, but otherwise essentially covered the area that would be Wyandotte County, plus down to the Kansas River. So a little bit of Johnson County was in the Wyandotte Reserve when it was established. That particular uh, reservation was established in 1844 uh, when uh, the Wyandots purchased it from the, from the Delawares and uh, moved in to, to take control of that area. And of course, 10 years later, we have the Kansas-Nebraska Act, which ends all of that. And what we have coming out of it then uh, is a movement. What this particular map shows is with regard to the Kansas, um, their origins are indicated uh, back here in uh, Indiana, um, uh, Kentucky area. Then they worked their way west, and they would have been coming in conjunction with the Osage and the Omaha, the Ponca, and the Quapaw. The, um, when they come to the, the uh, Mississippi River, the Quapaw uh, move south and basically establish themselves uh, along the mouth of the, Ar the Arkansas River where it flows into the Mississippi. The other four tribes work their way west. The Osage, in a sense, drop off first. Then the Kansa in the northeastern part of what would today be Kansas. The Omaha and the Ponca move on up into what is today Nebraska. Uh, and this is all occurring roughly 1450 to 1500, as best we can understand. Uh, the dates are not precise, and there's, there's some uh, uh, argument about that. So those are the, the changes that take place um, uh, in regard to, uh, to all of this. Well, I've thrown out a great deal of uh, information here, some about the Indians and the trade practices that they had, some about the changes that come into play as far as when first the French come.
and then uh, beginning with 1803 and the Louisiana Purchase, the effect of um, uh, American policies with regard to these various tribes. And basically the, the, the pattern is that they are progressively removed to smaller and smaller uh, pieces of territory. And ultimately, uh, with regard to the Kansas, the, the, the uh, Missouri, and the Osage, they all wind up in what was, is left of Indian Territory after the establishment of uh, Kansas and Nebraska territories. And of course, Indian Territory would be today's Oklahoma. I'd like to see if I could answer any questions or if I've raised any issues for you. <laughs>